Sounds good. So hi, I, hello everyone, I'm Lu from Alasio. I also have been here, and today we will give a talk about how to accelerate cloud chaining with Alasio. Yeah, maybe B, you can first introduce Alasio to everyone that doesn't know Alasio before. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Lu. Alasio is an open source project started from UC Berkeley EMP lab about six or five, uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, today, we have more than 1,000 contributors on GitHub globally with 5,000 more uh, plus uh, GitHub stars. So uh, the project is like a, originally a pro research project and used the name Taikan uh, a few years back. And then uh, originally, it was actually designed to be a distributed uh, off-heap memory store storage manager for Spark, uh, it's, uh, at that time, like a lot of different research projects are started uh, in AMP lab to help Spark or run a Spark uh, ecosystem. And uh, Taikan, or uh, later Aluxio, was one of them. Later on, we open sourced this project, and, then, and this is under Apache 2.0 uh, license. And we get a lot of people downloading, trying this out. And today, according to the uh, open SSF metrics, and some collaboration with Google. It's listed as the number nine most critical open source Java products on GitHub. And we have like a, a lot of like users. So you can feel free to join us to ask any question, join the Slack channel here. Next. <clears throat> so we have a lot of different users use Aluxio, not only for machine learning. Actually, initially, Aluxio is more used for the uh, the batch jobs, Spark jobs, accelerated Spark jobs. Later on, like uh, interactive queries like uh, Presto. And later on, <clears throat> we see new emerging use cases like uh, machine learning, which we will talk about in this session. And we see different users across many different industries. Uh, for example, in the teleco, in uh, retail, in banking, financial, e-commerce, or in gaming internet, a lot. So this is maybe not the most up-to-date figure to show the different logos using the Luxo technology, open source technology. But yeah, it's a, uh, you can see from there, you see a lot of big names, big logos. And a uh, little bit about myself and also Lou, uh, I, will, I will go first. So uh, I'm the founding engineer and also now VP open source in Luxio. Uh, before joining Luxio, I was working in Google. And before joining Google, I was a, a PhD student in Carnegie Mellon University working on distributed storage systems and distributed and networking systems. Lou, please. And for me, I'm a machine learning engineer at Lasio. So I studied data science back in George Washington University. And I'm mainly responsible for integrating Lasio with machine learning and deep learning these days. So you guys can maybe uh, will always see me and being in our Slack channel answering questions. So for today's agenda, we will go through multiple different points. Like we will first go through the chaining pain points, especially the data chaining pain points these days that many companies are facing. And we will try about some traditional ways to solve the data problems in cloud chaining. And then we will introduce like how to use Elastio to accelerate their cloud chaining. And in the end, we will give some of the use case about how companies like Microsoft how they actually use Elastio in their production environment to accelerate their cloud chaining. So for the first part, the chaining pain points. And for talking about like machine learning or deep learning chaining, we want it to be really good performance, really fast speed and low cost. Uh, yeah, we want everything. And for good performance, basically we want to have a really good model and enough data. Uh, without a good model, our performance will not be good. And without enough data to fit that model, we cannot get our target performance. And for fast speed, um, we can use either a stronger, much stronger GPU, like changing from P100 to V100. We can gradually reduce the chaining hours. Or if one single machine is not enough, we can do the chaining in multiple machines. Where we can do the chaining parallelly. And for low cost, like GPU cluster are pretty expensive these days. And setting a cluster by your own and lay idle doesn't seem ideal. So maybe many people are moving to the cloud to do their chaining so that they can do their own demand chaining. And the cluster is easy to set up and scale. It's a relatively lower cost. 
And another part for low cost is actually we want to make sure that our expensive GPU resources get fully used. So to summary, in order for us to do a good performance, fast speed and low cost in the cloud chaining, we want to have a really good model. We not to have enough data to fit that model. We may want to consider moving to cloud for distributed chaining. And we want to make sure that our expensive GPU resources are fully used. And actually many companies come to us and say that, hey, we have good model. We have far than enough data. We, can, we, are not, we know how to do the cloud chaining and we know how to do distributed chaining in cloud. But after we fulfill the first three, we found that our GPU utilization rate is really low. And what's the problem behind? And basically, we have a, a, a really powerful GPU cluster. And the more powerful the GPU are, the higher data throughput that it requires. By changing from P100 to V100, we actually have five as more data throughput required to make our GPU happy. So now we're talking about all the data ping points for cloud chaining. The first one is the one that I just talked about. How to make sure that we have high enough data throughput during our chaining to our, make our GPU busy. And the other part is that because we're moving to cloud and there are, we are chaining cluster and the data maybe reside in different areas. Like maybe we have a responsive GPU cluster for chaining and our data maybe reside in the remote HDFS also remote cloud storage, and they are separated. How do you make your chaining job able to assess the data become a problem? And the last one is that you can assess data and the data is fast enough, but you need to make sure that the data is stable enough. We don't want to chain for maybe eight hours and then suddenly oh, our, our, we have some IO errors, which cause our chaining just to fail. And we, maybe we need to redo the eight hour chaining again. So that's bring us the data requirements. Each machine needs to have access to the chaining data. And when assessing the data, we want low latency and high throughput. And we want strong data stability and high GTU, GPU utilization rate to make sure that we fully use all the resources that we have. Okay, now we will go to the next session, which we will talk about some traditional cloud chaining data solutions. I think that's the solution that most people really familiar about. It's pretty simple. It's just like, okay, every machine needs to assess the data. Then we copy the full data set from our storage to each of the chaining machine. And in this way, when we are doing the chaining, it's actually really fast because the data is just your local data. But as you can see here, uh, transferring the whole data set from storage to each of the machine this time is like, it usually would cost a long time. And during the data copy time, the GPU is idle. And we don't want our expensive GPU to be idle. And also because uh, we copy the whole data set in each of the machine, it may, the data may have some disk or file error. And any disk or file error may not be easy to figure out. And it may cause the whole chaining to error out. And yeah, and just as you can see that copying data before chaining will make our expensive GPU idle, which is definitely the things that we don't want to have. And the other solution is that we don't want to copy the data. It's so complicated and it takes time. Why not this, those chaining jobs, they just get their data from the storage when they need it. So that's how we see we get data on demand. And by using this way, um, we don't need to prepare the data beforehand. But the problem is that when we are doing the chaining job, we actually uh, need to go through the network to get the data that we want. And network IO could become the performance bottleneck. So in this way, our network is actually, the performance is bounded by the network IO and we have really high latency and low GPU utilization rate during the chaining. And because we need to assess the UFS, it's likely that we will exceed some of the storage request rate and the data assessed may be error out because you passed the request rate. 
And now I will give to Bean for talking how to like accelerate the chaining with Elasio. Thanks, Lou. <coughs> Thanks, Lou. I uh, will talk about the architecture and how the, the, the workflow for Alexia to help in this uh, cloud, the training in the cloud uh, type of workloads. As you can see, a lot of different, as you can see from this figure, a lot of times you're using Kubernetes or this type of a container orchestration framework to schedule your TensorFlow jobs to uh, a training platform. And in this case, Alexio can, we recommend to deploy Alexio together with this type of a computation. So it's very close or even co-located on the same machine, same set of machines with your TensorFlow, PyTorch or different training platform. And then you can accelerate reading data from the remote object store, uh, which can cause a lot of network traffic or slowness because of the retrieving data repeatedly. Next slide. So basically this is the architecture here. We have an interface called the POSIX. In, so it's uh, using Fuse to emulate the POSIX interface, which is a standardized uh, interface for applications to read from your local file system directories. Uh, for example, you are reading when you are using a Linux machine or you, uh, your Mac, Mac OS, and you are actually using the POSIX to API to access the data from your devices. And we are doing the similar thing to emulate. Alexio itself is a distributed system, which we will talk about later. It's a, but we can emulate this as a one single data point <coughs> directory inside your machine. And in this case, you can see from this, uh, from this figure, uh, we have different diagrams. We have different directories and different directories corresponds to different uh, ender storage. You can mount many different ender storage into the same Alexio namespace, which is logical, but like logical namespace is backed by different devices or different physical stores. And now in your directory, in your view, your local view from your Linux box or Mac OS, you see really Alexio service as a single directory and you can access this directory, which is backed by many different, uh, like in subdirectories, backed by many different other object stores. And in this, in this figure, can go back, sorry, can you still have the previous one? Uh, we have like HDFS, object store, uh, NFS, or different HDFS. They are all corresponds to a single subdirectory in here, in this data, in this one point. So in this case, we uh, users actually, if they just want to talk, if they are just, if they just care about how to access the data, they don't really need to know, oh, where my data is, as long as they know the logical path for the data, uh, then that's enough and they can just, Browse. They can navigate and browse the data from from here. Next slide. So let's go down to Alexio and see what is really Alexio providing as a as a system. What's the service is providing? And the first thing is really the caching capacity as a distributed system. So we have attribute a distributed caching engine inside Alexio. You have a maybe ten different or a hundred different Alexio servers and your caching capacity is distributed across these N different servers. Uh, so if you have a file, which is really large, sometimes this can happen for big data applications or for machine learning applications have, have files on the order of terabytes or a few hundred gigabytes. It's sometimes it's too big to put into one single file or on single serve. So in our, in our service, this will be divided into logical uh, blocks. There are logical caching units you can specify, users can specify. And uh, the data is basically dis dispatched to different servers. So you have a distributed uh, storage engine to serve the single logical file. And also we have this capacity to have the replications. So you, for certain files, they are super uh, super popular across your applications, you can definitely make more replications, even actually, actually for the, just for the hot part for this file. And also we have a single, as I mentioned, this is a single unified namespace and inside you can mount multiple different uh, other storage, external, we call the UF as uh, external physical storage into this unified logical namespace. And users, as I mentioned, like you can just care about which logical namespace, which logical file path I'm accessing rather than uh, which protocol, uh, which version, which authentication I use to go to this specific physical storage. Next. 
So it's actually very simple. Like for example, if you want to mount one external storage into a log geological namespace, you just run the command here, uh, like as, as we show you run Aluxio space FS space mount, and then you give the Aluxio logical pass and with the like physical storage pass. And also in this case, it's S3, you need a key, you need two keys, access key and also secret key. And that's, that's it. And you have this logical namespace called slash S3 backed by your S3 bucket. Next, the next stage, if you want to load data into this Luxio service, all you need to do is just like run this command. Uh, it's called FS, uh, distributed load, uh, slash S3. S3 is the logical path. You remember we mount, we map this into S3. And then this will launch a job in the background to load uh, data uniformly into the Luxio servers. If you have 10 different servers, this will just uniformly assign the jobs to do 10 different servers to load part of the data into the, these 10 servers. And then, uh, of course, you can set some preference there, like I prefer certain, certain nodes better than the others. And then in this case, you will just have the data remote, persisted remotely in S3 bucket, but now bring this up to your platform, data platform, your training platform. Next slide. So the data can be cached actually dynamically during the training. So uh, in the best case, the training platform, the training machine has data cached locally or part of the data cached locally. Then you can read this data locally at a local speed, no network involved, which is awesome. Uh, so in that case, if you, for example, if you mount a Luxio to manage a RAM disk in that case, you can get um, up to several or tens gigabytes per second, uh, that level of speed. If the data is not really cached locally, however, the data is actually in a different remote Alexa server, a uh, different, uh, we'll call the worker, Alexa worker. In that case, so the data can be read, uh, can be just read from that remote worker, not local, local worker, but from that remote worker at a network speed. Uh, and hopefully this network is better than accessing data directly to your storage. It's, um, for example, it's a, maybe in a different region or in this offline in a different, across the, across, uh, across wire to just access the data. And in case the data is neither in your local worker nor your, uh, the other workers uh, in this electrical system, uh, don't worry about it. We can still read this transparently fetch the data from the persistent storage like the S3 or some other storage. And your applications see no difference at all. The only difference is maybe in this, in this, in this case, uh, you just experience a little bit more uh, slowness because you're really reading from the end of storage, you, from the external storage, and there's nothing, nothing cached. So uh, just add normal speed. Next. Yeah, so you can see, uh, we have different solutions I just mentioned by Lou. Uh, you can directly copy the data. So actually I talked to a lot of different people, different users, and this is pretty common, pretty commonly seen uh, in, for data scientists to train their models, especially when the models is small, they can afford to directly copy the data uh, from their maybe centralized server, data server to a uh, data service to these local machines one by one, I run some scripts and then train the model and then delete the data afterwards. And so copy data is a manual process and it's sometimes it's very error prone because human is involved. Uh, or we see sometimes it's, uh, but like that solution gives you the best performance. You, you, can, you can read the data in the very good, in, the, in, in, a, in a very good manner because it's just all, everything is local or you can directly access the data across network to uh, read from the external storage. In this case, no data preparation here. Uh, I mean, copying data, but uh, the training process can take longer because <laughs> we see a lot of times the GPUs are just waiting for the data, um, which is not good because GPU, the hour, GPU hours are more expensive. And also what you can do is if you, if you can just pre preload data and then just making the training and the preloading in the same, like, like a, a, a happening at the same time, then you can just get a very good performance while you can start earlier. Next slide. So 
we have multiple, as I mentioned, we have like a, the multiple different copies for the data and also we have the retry mechanism. Uh, so like, for example, certain data is not, um, like if there is a worker just restarted or like you lost a worker in the Kubernetes uh, environment, which can happen, um, everything is elastic. And then we have the retry mechanism so we can just go to a different source to fetch the same data. And in the worst case, we just go to the external storage. And also uh, as a service itself, we build high availability for both our master, which is metadata service, and also the worker, the set of workers, which is the data service for data safety and the metadata safety. So uh, by the way, we can accelerate both the metadata fetching and data fetching. And then previously I was only focusing on the data pass, but on the metadata pass, we also do the similar thing. We just cache the metadata on the, this master node on this master node. And every time when you access the metadata, like I, I want to know the size of the file, how many blocks, uh, like uh, or who's the user and group for this file. And you don't need to go to the external storage. Uh, sometimes it's either slow or sometimes it's not free. Uh, and for example, you, you, on AWS, if you call the APIs to get the list of, list of buckets, sometimes it's, it's a charge. Go ahead. So, uh, so the solution for Alexio distributed caching is to support basically have certain advantages here. We can support multiple data sources. We can have multiple training frameworks to read data from that based on the POSIX API. And we can support uh, just like one click to preload the data across uh, dynamically and uniformly into the Alexio service to get, bring the data closer to GPUs, to platforms. Uh, and in this case, because we are providing both the metadata service and data service, we get a better data stability and also less IO errors. So, uh, and also we can use the remote and distributed data as just like a local disk directory, it, which uh, tremendously help data scientists to manage the data. So sometimes they are the group of people, they don't want to really go down to the nature of the complexity, nature complexity of this like a distributed systems. So they can just focus on training logic and improve the models. Next slide. And uh, yeah, as I just mentioned, we have the access to data, easy access to data, low latency and strong data stability and also the high GPU utilization achieved. Okay, uh, we'll just get back to Lou, talk about the use cases so you can get a better understanding about how users really use this uh, open source technology to speed up their training for IO. Oh, thanks, Bing. And before I go into the use cases, so if you guys have any questions, then feel free to ask in the sessions chat channel so that we can uh, we can also have the Q&A in the end. But feel free to ask wherever you want. Okay, so I will talk about some of the use cases like how users use Alasio in production environment to actually speed out their cloud chaining. So first we will talk about the Microsoft case in Microsoft, they actually they have more than 400 like training jobs, which want to read data from Azure before they do the training and write data back to Azure after they do the training. So the total data size is larger than one terabyte. Their previous way is the way that we just mentioned, the solution one, they directly copy the full data set from cloud to each of the training nodes. And the problem is that they just like they have a large amount of IO operations to the cloud in a short period of time. And this amount of work will easy to cause the IO errors and it's easy to pass the Azure request limit, which they do face that they actually pass the request limit and all the future copying job will just failed. And because they need to copy the data to the cloud, their GPU is idle when they are waiting for the IO operations and GPU resources is really expensive. And by using Alasio, you can see the graph in the left. So the first graph is that uh, in the beginning uh, on the end, they have really low GPU usage. And those are the time that this cluster is actually using for like getting data from Azure or unloading data to Azure. So this two period has really low GPU usage. But by using Alasio, we can see that the GPU utilization rate is pretty consistent from at, from beginning to the end. And because the we can maintain the GPU utilization rate at a relatively high level. So Alasio actually speed out the chaining by 
it mainly because we reduce the IO wait time. And so what how Microsoft did is that they actually use a large pre-catch ability so that in the beginning of the job, they launch the distributed load command, the command that being just recommended so that they load the training data into the cluster in the backend. And at the same time, they just re they start the training job. The training job will say that, okay, the data is in Elastio, that they fetch data at Elastio at a really quick speed. And if data is not in Elastio, they just go to the remote UFS to fetch data during runtime and also catch those data in Elastio for future quicker usage. And one other benefit that Microsoft saw is that they actually can share the Elastio data across multiple tasks. So multiple training jobs will be able to assess the same Elastio catch system at the same time. Because of we use Elastio, so Elastio didn't do the aggregated IO operation in a short period of time. We're actually streaming reading requests. So this uh, streaming read request will avoid the EC like cloud storage request limit. And also like, because we have also retry mechanism. So the IO operation that like the IO errors will be much lower. The IO error rate will be much lower during their training jobs. And the other use case is Alibaba. They mainly use Elastio to improve their data throughput. And before they use Elastio, they go through the, they just through the high performance network to go to their object storage to fetch data during runtime. And at that time, the, the network throughput for them is like 300 megabytes per second. But by using Elastio, either data is stored locally or in nearby workers, we can bring other performance to up to 6 GB per second, depends on where the data is local or just nearby. And if you want to see more information like how Alibaba do those kind of testing, feel free to read the white paper that link it below. And the, the last use case is actually Momo. Um, Momo, uh, if you guys doesn't know anything about Momo, Momo is basically Tinder in China side. And they have large amount of monthly active users and large amount of data set. And Momo actually have multiple Elastio clusters, including thousands of Elastio nodes. And they store more than 100 terabyte data. And Elastio just, they use Elastio to accelerate their searching and chaining tasks and they are continuing to develop new use cases. And the reason that they go for Elastio, Elastio is actually a central like, data caching solution inside Momo. And the reason that they use Elastio is mainly because Elastio supports different multiple like, under storage and multiple compute and chaining frameworks. So they can actually build a pipeline that they may use the Presto Spark to get the data from one uh, under storage and then process those data and then store in Elastio and then use Elastio in their actual chaining. So they can build a pipeline using Elastio. And also Elastio can help them to accelerate all their searching and chaining tasks by using our distributed caching ability. And the other part is that uh, they use an HDFS and self as their under storage. And they want to make sure that their under storage is very stable they won't want to have a large amount of requests to their under storage in a short period of time. And by using Elastio, it actually reduces many of the metadata and data overhead, the interactions with your under storage to make your under storage much more stable. And in other case, uh, that Momo actually used Elastio in some of their training jobs. And one example is that they use Elastio to do their billions image chaining they have more than two billions of small files that store in their Ceph. And they want to use PyTorch with Elastio with Ceph. So PyTorch, they use it to launch the training job and Elastio using as the caching for those billions of small files. Elastio responsible for connecting with Ceph for getting the data that it want. And uh, also the, uh, to make sure that if, the, to make sure that the Ceph have a reasonable overhead. So by using this framework, it largely reduces the metadata and data interaction with the remote staff. So it actually improved their training performance. And they, are, they also use uh, Elastio in other two use cases, which are pretty similar is that 
whenever you have some data or models needed for your training, you just directly put in, upload it in, into your prediction storage, HDFS or other object storage. And then you use Alasio to load those data from your remote storage into a, a Alasio cluster, which is much closer to your training jobs. And then your training nodes just load those data from Alasio concurrently. And Alasio is responsible for serving those uh, like a large amount of requests from your training jobs. So to summary, Alasio may help you if you have one or multiple scenarios that listed below. If you want to do distributed training, especially in the cloud, or when your training and the data is are separate. And when you have a large amount of data, maybe more than terabytes, and especially large amount of small files or images, which is a common case in our recent training. And when your network I.O. cannot satisfy your GPU requirement, so fetching the data through network cannot satisfy your GPU. When you have multiple data sources and multiple chaining and compute frameworks on top. When you want to keep your under storage stable enough and avoid a receding request limit and other kind of problems from your under storage. And, and if you want to share the data between multiple chaining tasks. So if you have one or more scenarios that you may want to try to use Elastio to see if it can fulfill your need. And if you are not quite sure about whether your use cases actually work, then feel free to just maybe uh, join up Slack channel and show us uh, and just tell us that what's your problem, what's the challenges that you face, what's the scenario that you want to try Elastio and we can give more detail and more customized information on top of that. Yeah, so feel free to visit our website, ask questions or anything you want to ask in our Slack channel and follow our social media on Twitter and LinkedIn. For any talks like this one, we will definitely show them on the social media so you guys can get the first hand information. And we will, we will post our really latest like technical blogs in our Elastio website. So feel free to also visit it. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions? Seems like there are no questions here, but uh, maybe we can spend, we have a few more minutes here. So Lou, maybe you can spend a few more minutes talking about the latest uh, uh, the roadmap in for for this type of workloads Alexio is planning to do, and what's the latest, uh, for example, progress things like that. Okay, yeah, I think Andrew is typing a question. So when we are waiting for Andrew, and um, so for the process API, it's really interesting that uh, this is not uh, usually for a feature. It may be a tall side down feature that that uh, designed by us and then implemented by us, but for Alexio. This is actually a request from the community. And they come to us say that, hey, we want to use Elastio in our machine training job. We want to accelerate the machine learning training job. Can you guys help us? And then we figure out, okay, maybe that's the way that we can go. And then we start to enter these areas. We do find that many things that are totally different from what we expect. Like from the traditional workloads like Spa and Presto, it's more like, uh, a big data set, like large files, big chunks of data. But for machine learning world, it's like tons of small files, which actually increase many of the Elastio's overhead. So we come to see how we can fit Elastio into the machine learning world. And recently we do many of the testing, we do many of the, the quick iteration on these areas. Like recently we, uh, we improved like 5S performance in one of the machine learning jobs uh, it's, it's a benchmark that using DALI data loader to load data. And it's a, it's a job that we run in a large cluster and with multiple process that reading a large amount of small files from Alasio. We improve that performance to 5S. Uh, and it's, it's actually not easy because we need to see where's the bottleneck. Uh, we need to understand all the Alasio's uh, machine learning read pattern and how to make Elastio free into the machine learning world. So it's quite challenging and interesting. Okay, I see the questions here. And you have a question. Well, it's a long one. I feel like this is maybe a question for me. Uh, let me first read the question. 
how does the Alexio Enterprise development work versus the Alexio Open Source development? How do we advocate for features to be implemented in the open source version? And I worked at uh, uh, Wikimedia Foundation, and we are interested in using Alexio soft data integration problems. We use Kubernetes for authentication, a uh, Kerbos, sorry. but the, the IUC Kerbos support is not in open source Alexio, which may block us from using Alexio. Yeah, uh, thanks, Andrew, for asking. I think I uh, either communicated with you or some, or some of your colleagues before on our Slack channel. Uh, so, so basically, I, I, I mentioned that the Kerberos support is in the in the uh, in the in enterprise version. So typically, uh, we have a there is a dividing line for us to decide whether this is an open source project versus this is a uh, this is open source feature and this is the closed source uh, enterprise feature. And the dividing line is typically this is for uh, like enterprise or if this is for something. Uh, like uh, people can quickly start and with a uh, with a small like a relatively small actually it's not the case actually the most the largest case is also with using the open source version so it's made mostly for like a I would say enterprise grade features uh, if you still you know if you are working in the enterprise world there's a lot of like integration features or uh, security requirements with this type of banking or financial institutions. And typically these are the enterprise features we put. And uh, most of these features, I would say like 90%, 95% of the source code is actually is in the open source. So go back to the particular feature you're talking about, the Kerbal, Kerbal support. Um, so I was actually a little bit, um, I was a little bit brief on the, on the, on the, on Slack channel when, we're, when we are mentioning that. So uh, there are two parts. One is talking to a Kerberized external storage, and that part is open sourced. So if you want to talk a secure HDFS, that part is open sourced, but with certain limitations. And the limitation includes you have to renew the to uh, Kerberos tokens every uh, like I, I don't know, like every few days, uh, depend, depending on the expiration period you set for your Kerberos tokens. So uh, other than that, that part is supported in open source. It's just like a very manual and it's very quite, error, I would say like a, it's pretty manual process. So if you want to have the full support, definitely that's the, that is only in the enterprise uh, edition. And uh, um, yeah, so that's basically for the Kerberos support. Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, other than that, I think you can talk to us, talk to us to see whether we can collaborate on uh, certain features and actually, actually let's maybe, Andrew uh, and Ben, let's have a discussion. I will, I will schedule, I will schedule, uh, I will DM you on the Slack. Uh, so I can, I can just go and maybe have an offline discussion with you and see whether your requirements can be fulfilled already with the open source or with the open source edition it depends on what's the, what's the nature of this request yeah so next question from joseph i have a technical question in my understanding alexa master node behaves similar to hdfs no, name node correct story metadata for all files and Alexa cluster it is also known a known issue that a uh, scaling name node is the bonding would similar be alexa master nodes uh, Joseph, yeah, this is a, this is definitely correct. Uh, we have have spent quite a few uh, years actually down uh, along the along the ro road to improve the metadata service scalability. Uh, we have done tons of the work. Uh, things like, uh, for example, so the first approach we're taking is to scale this uh, up, scale this uh, vertically. So to make it a single node, it's a still a single node. Uh, although we have the HA mode, but the other nodes are the stand standby masters. For the primary master, it's a still single box. And uh, in the past two years, we spent a lot of cycles to improve this throughput for this single box, for this uh, mas metadata, master, metadata, master, metadata service, including, uh, for example, we uh, make this inode tree as fine-grained locking uh, inode tree uh, versus in the HDFS world, you see a global uh, heavy lock on this inode tree. So, um, so the concurrency is definitely much better for us. And the other part includes we use uh, a lot of optimizations on the, G, uh, on the RPC side. For example, we, we, uh, we switch to gRPC uh, to use a lot of fine-tuned uh, thread pool to, uh, to overcome certain limitations previously in the uh, net, uh, connection, connection numbers, uh, things like that. 
Uh, I think there is a few more. There are quite a few more optimizations. Um, I cannot just like recall them on top of my there's, mind. There's one more that we use, uh, ROSDB. Oh, ROSDB, like, yeah. Yeah. Basically, uh, previously, we store all the inode trees in the heap. But now we also support, like, we, su uh, we store in part of the metadata actually on disk. And this size is much more bigger. Yeah. So that is for the capacity bottleneck. Uh, originally, or similarly, like in HDFS name node case, uh, everything stored, uh, the cluster information is in memory, in the J JVM memory, which is very uh, quite in the like inefficient in, 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 in terms of like a, a capacity. And also it is quite uh, a bottleneck for you to store much more data. So, uh, so in our case, we migrate this part of storage into an on-disk representation use RocksDB. So you can easily, easily store more than uh, a billion or several billion uh, files in a single cluster with the with the help moving this to the uh, to the off off heap, and uh, still like uh, with all this combination of techniques or optimizations, uh, we are, as I mentioned like we can handle several billion files and also uh, several thousand or tens of thousands connections concurrent connections, and also in terms of throughput because we have the highly concurrent inode. Uh, data representation for that. Uh, the, in the latest round of testing from our one of our biggest users, they see definitely uh, like the, for the most important feature, like a list a, list a directory, they can see more than uh, 200k uh, operations per second uh, for that for that level of intensity. But still, <laughs> I know like once you scale to thousands of nodes, you will see this issue, and we're working with the. Uh, community, including like uh, Tencent, uh, this kind of internet giants, to see how to how we can split the work and make it scale uh, ho horizontally, like a split sharding on uh, sharding the namespace or doing some federation. Um, like everyone sees the same issue in in this world. We just like to see how we can gradually bring these ideas to the system. Uh, next question. I'm oh, sorry. Is some clarification for Joseph. Uh, this helps a lot, so our assumption that we should see less RAM for like, some master was correct for reasons we didn't know. Yeah, for, because we, you, you can, you can you, there are two ways to run the Luxor master. One is using memory aggressively. Another way is, oh, let's sacrifice a little bit of the performance so we can leverage the on-disk storage, like SSD. Uh, so in that way, actually even, even, even for memory, because it's not a good idea to let JVM handle memory. JVM is pretty bad on that. So we can you can leverage the external storage, either SSD or non-volatile memory or memory DRAM, but in a different way uh, to 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 store all this information. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, Lou, uh, we like uh, another thing like Lou and I are working recently. Is really to to continue performance performance optimization as as mentioned by Lou, uh, and in the last round in the, in the current round of optimization, we're very focused on having it really working well for some, a massive amount of small files, and and that uh, that actually works. Like we see uh, for ImageNet, uh, we see a five x performance improvement compared to some other previous round of benchmark, and Lou is writing a white paper. For that, and stay tuned. Uh, we will have like end-to-end -end instructions how to set up the cluster, uh, Kubernetes, and a lot of different things, uh, like in this stack, and to show the performance benefits. And also another very cool feature Lou is working on right now is to have this ability to tell you, oh, this is Alexio and this is the POSIX API we're providing. How much IOs per second we can really get from this uh, from this setup? Uh, he or she is writing basically with our, in our team. We're writing a tool distributed with Alexa directly, and you can run this command and can tell you, oh, on this node, I get 300 megabytes per second if I'm reading from this set of files, or uh, maybe with a bigger file, we get a more performance. Um, so it's it's a tool you can just directly run without running on any other extra service. Okay, thanks, people, in charge of using that. And uh, I think we are run out of time. So thanks again for everyone for joining this session and this talk. And feel free to like join our Slack channel and ask uh, any yeah. questions there. Yeah. And thanks, oh. uh, thanks Andrew and Jewish. Oh, sorry, I don't. I cannot pronounce the name correctly.
But thanks everyone for asking those amazing questions. Thank you. Yeah, join <laughs> us on the Slack, and we can just follow up there. Thank you. Thank you.